this computer. There we go. Okay. So you guys are in the Raising Backyard Chickens 101 program. Again, I'm Michelle Wheeler from the Lackawanna College Environmental Education Center, and I've been keeping chickens for about six years um, on my personal property, and we've had chickens at the center. This would have been our our third year, um, but those chickens are home with me right now so that we don't have to um, run to the center every day. So, um, The first thing, oh, it's not moving to slide number two. Okay, there we go. So the first question is, should you raise poultry? Um, first thing you have to know is, does your zoning allow it? So can you raise chickens? What are your reasons and your goals? And do you have the space for your birds? And do you have the time? So these are some of the things we'll cover. Step one, can you keep chickens? Um, to find this out, you'll have to go to your local township office and check with your homeowners association to make sure you're allowed to have birds. Um, most places around here in Northeast PA, this isn't too much of an issue, but of course this can vary from um, individual to individual. So it's always good to check before you get committed into um, having birds that you've purchased and or a coop outside. Step two, what are your reasons and goals? Now these are just some things that we've come across in the years that people are interested in. Of course there might be more than this, but pets, fresh eggs, homegrown meat, um, natural insect control, permaculture, homesteading, for personal use, and also for business. So pets, you can see here, um, in this current situation, it's always good to have a chicken and a tutu running around your yard. That'll definitely um, lighten up your mood. And some chicken hugs or some petting some chickens. So chickens make great backyard companions. Um, they're well suited for um, just hanging out and enjoying the day. Fresh eggs from your own backyard. Uh, this is, admit somebody else here, okay. Somebody else just joined our meeting. Hi, welcome. We're talking about reasons you might want some, some uh, chickens in your own backyard. So there's lots of different breeds of chickens. Throughout this presentation, we won't only be talking about chickens, we'll be talking about poultry in general, but specifically chickens for egg laying purposes. There are multiple different breeds of chickens and they will lay a different colored egg. All of these eggs in this slide here will taste the same, whether it's that traditional California white egg that we see so frequently at the store or um, some of the more like green eggs like the Americana or the traditional kind of brown egg. So all of these eggs will taste the same inside. What makes um, us think of that fresh cracked farm egg. It's not so much the color on the outside, but it's the nutrition that the birds have been eating. So free range will make that um, a yummier, more richer yolk, uh, like what we'd expect from a farm egg. And then my picture on the left here are some examples of breeds of chickens. So not every chicken will lay the same amount of eggs throughout the year. So if you're looking for egg production and that's really important to you, it would be a good idea to research a chicken or make sure that you purchase a chicken breed that produces more eggs throughout the year than, um, than what some of the other birds. Uh, typically you can expect one egg per bird per day. Sometimes that's an egg and a half per day, um, one egg per day and a half. So you may not actually get um, seven eggs per bird some throughout the week. Sometimes maybe you'll get six, so. Okay. So another reason people like to have chickens um, is to grow their own meat. And uh, there can be some controversy with all of this, so we won't get into too much of it, but just knowing that it's an option. Um, the picture here on the left is a Cornish cross, uh, AKA that's like our broiler chicken. And they are um, traditionally used in the factory farms, um, but they're also very popular on local homesteads because they grow so fast. 
So this bird is specifically bred um, to grow fast. They can go to butcher at about eight weeks. At that time, there'll be about four pounds um, of meat to bring in the house. Um, the picture on the right here is a dual purpose bird. So even if you did want to do some meat chickens, but you really didn't want to go with the um, bread broilers or the Cornish cross, you can go with a traditional um, bird and they are going to take about six weeks before you're ready to um, butcher them, but they will also produce eggs. Down here in the middle, we have our Red Ranger versus our broiler chicken. Um, this Red Ranger is a third option and he is a hybrid between a dual purpose bird and a Cornish cross. And they would be ready to be butchered um, at closer to like a 12 week, week mark. And they would be a, um, about a four pound bird as well then. But you can see in this photo how much smaller that red ranger is that's at four to five weeks old where the cornish cross is also at four to five weeks old so i think i have my new spotlight thanks you guys can can see where i'm pointing at now so okay so we have our meat birds Another reason to get um, poultry for the backyard would be natural insect control. This was one of the reasons that we initiated the uh, chicken coop at the Environmental Education Center. Um, we wanted to eliminate some of the ticks and other pesky bugs that were in the yard, especially for all of our outdoor programming. So when we were developing our chicken coop at that center, we were more worried about natural trick natural insect control versus uh, egg production and definitely not meat production for the center. So when we started that chicken coop, we started with 20 guinea fowl, which is the bird that's on our left here. These are pearl guinea fowl. And we did not purchase, but another good tick eater, uh, an insect eater is the chick, the turkeys. So right here we have our our white turkey, and then we have some heritage turkeys here as well. So these are all really great choices if you're looking to really get into something that would eat the insects. So both of these species of poultry are going to eat about 80% insect versus 20% grain. A traditional chicken or your bantams and some of your other poultry would eat more grain and would be more looking for your tomatoes and stuff like that versus these guys. So these are both really good options if you were looking for something to free range in your garden. So a guinea fowl is gonna be much more interested in eating the slug off of your tomato plants than eating the actual tomato. So these guys, I would be comfortable letting them in my garden once in a while, where of course the chickens, you wanna make sure that they don't get in there because they love all of your vegetables. So another reason to keep um, poultry is to become closer to the earth or permaculture or a homesteading perspective. So permaculture is um, the idea of gardening with whole systems thinking involved. And you want to simulate mother nature's natural cycles and ecosystems. So just like I used the example in the last one for letting your guinea fowl into your, your your garden, that would be um, a really great way for permaculture or a permaculture practice because you're not spraying in it, uh, a pesticide on your food, you're letting the guinea fowl eat those, those things that you don't want from your garden. Um, and poultry in general are often used as a really good example of permaculture because they can offer a closed loop system. So for example, um, you can, feed your chickens kitchen scraps and or garden waste and then your chickens will supply you eggs and meat and then the chickens will also supply you manure and then in turn create more kitchen scraps and garden waste and make your garden grow nicer so so chickens are a great great 
contribution to a homestead or your garden or permaculture. I think I have chat here. Let me see if I can. Whoop. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see the chat or not. Oh, great. Okay, so we have some people say they have no chickens yet, want to be prepared, some peeps that aren't ready to go outside. And can the guinea fowl go in with the chickens? So great question. Yes, the guinea fowl can go right in with the chickens. Um, and I have a whole slide, I think, for guinea fowl a little bit later here. But guinea fowl, um, we always stick them right in with our chickens and get them used to going back into the coop. Okay. So after you know why you want to raise uh, poultry, you're going to want to make sure you choose the right bird. So do you need chickens? Do you want meat chickens, ducks, bantams? A bantam is a smaller chicken. So if you live in an urban setting or if you have a smaller backyard, that might be um, a nice choice for you. Um, turkeys, the guinea fowl, um, of course, game bird, geese, and peafowl can all be considered poultry. Okay, we have another question. I have all hens. Is it a good idea to get a rooster? And will guinea fowl roam and are they really noisy? <laughs> so guinea fowl are pretty noisy, but I absolutely love them. Um, let's see here. All right, so step four, getting the babies. Um, I've purchased chickens or baby chicks um, almost all of the ways I have listed here. So where can you get them? You can get them at the local Agway, you can get them at a local farm, you can get them at Tractor Supply, or you can purchase them online. So if you go to purchase your chickens online, your chicks, you will have um, an order sheet that looks like this. And what this is, is you have to choose how many you'd like to buy. Do you want male, do you want female, or do you want unsexed? So if you, of course, get unsexed, you will get some males, which are roosters, and you'll also get some, some females. It's a 50-50 chance. Um, but of course, that's also the cheapest. If you get them sexed, it's not guaranteed that they will be all female, but it will most likely be all female. And I'm not really sure why anyone would buy all rooster unless they just wanted them as meat birds and that was more affordable. Um, one of the things I'd like to mention with ordering online, usually you have to have a minimum of 15 or some, some places it's 20 or 30 chickens, and that might be more than you want to start with. So sometimes it's a good idea to um, go in with a neighbor or a friend, especially if you wanted to get like an assortment of Easter egg or chickens, which will have funky colored shells. Uh, so, you know, you might want to take 10 and, the, you know, a friend might want to take 10. It's also good to note when the next ship date will be. So I looked this up just the other day. So the next ship date is July 20th. However, if I were looking to purchase my chicks in early February, I may not want to order chicks on like February 3rd because... On February 3rd, if you order chicks online, they're gonna go through the mail and you will get them delivered to the post office. So to go through the mail is a, um, it's how all of them are going to, so sorry, it doesn't matter if you go to Agway or your tractor supply store, both of those places order chickens online as well. So. If you order them online, then you have to go to the post office and pick your chicks up directly. If you get your chicks from Agway or let's say Tractor Supply, they've already ordered them online and they've gone to the post office and picked them up. Now, when you pick your chicks up from the post office, um, there have been times where not all of my chicks have made it through shipping. And depending on, like, I have two, two daughters that did not really like to help me open the box when, when that didn't go great. 
So that's just something to keep in mind that there are casualties in shipping. Keeping in mind when you order them, if you know it's cold in February, it might not be a good time to ship chicks to Northeast PA because they are gonna be exposed to the weather and shipping. Um, so kind of looking at all of those factors to see if you wanna just go to Agway and make sure that they're already alive and well and you don't have to get to the, the post office. Um, those are things like that. This picture here is how you would purchase them if they were in uh, like a local tractor supply. So online, you'll have much more of um, choices of different breeds. When you go to Tractor Supply or Agway, you're kind of at the mercy of whatever they had ordered. Um, however, you can usually find some really great sales if you are in and out of Tractor Supply or Agway. So sometimes you can get like this one, the sign says Bantams are 50% off and the Cornish Cross at the end are also 50% off. So, um, so if you're looking to, um, grow some birds on a budget, that's a good way to do it. Oops. All right, next slide here. All right, so now we have, we have our chicks, we're getting ready to order them or we're getting ready to go to the farm or the tra uh, farm store. We are going to set up our brooder. I always say that it is best to get all of your brooder supplies out and ready before you place your order or before you head to the store. Um, and I say that because sometimes things break, even though you've been doing it for years, maybe your bulbs are dead, um, you never know. So it's always good to get this stuff out, ready to go. Um, it's also good to make sure that you have it all set up and your brooder lamp is on so that when you get home with your chicks, you can put them right in there and they have a nice warm, pre-warmed brooder ready for them. So a brooder is just gonna be a place that your chicks need to go for the first three to six weeks. Um, this year was a little weird and kind of cold for a little longer, right? We kept getting snow. So my chicks stayed inside a little longer than I expected them to. Uh, you can see a couple examples of brooders here. Um, I start off with a baby pool. Um, I think that's a really affordable and easy way to get your chicks a nice area. Um, but they will jump out of here before they're six weeks old. So you'll either have to wrap it with a fence or what I do is I, I have different stages. So the brooder here with the baby pool, I'll keep the chicks in until they're maybe two, three weeks old. They start to fly around then or kind of jump fly. And then I'll move them into this longer brooder here that they can't jump out of. And you can see these chicks are a little bit bigger. They're probably probably like four or five weeks old in this photo. So I like to use pine bedding just a big bag of pine chips that you can get at Tractor Supply, or um, oh, somebody else is trying to come in too. Yeah. So pine chips is what I use. I know people have used sand um, or hay, but I like the pine chips for the babies. You wanna make sure that it stays nice and clean. So every day you'll kind of do a spot check and um, I use like a, a kitty litter scoop to get any kind of poops um, at night when I'm giving everybody their, wa their food. I keep the food dish full and I change their water and make sure that the, the water stays full all day long. I personally don't use any of the medicated feed and I don't buy vaccinated chicks, um, but that is totally uh, your option and there's lots of research for both of those. Uh, so we won't get into that, but that is definitely an option. And then if you have a shorter brooder, you're definitely gonna to wanna to put some kind of cover over it uh, because your chicks will get out. So this is a nice option because they've got the screen on top and um, the chicks cannot get out of that. So chick temperature is important um, and your heat source so you can see in this photo, again, it's my baby pool. These are chicks from maybe last spring at the center. I have the heat lamp here. It is a red bulb underneath there. 
Um, and you can see the chicks are all kind of huddled up in there. So the first week they bring them home, you're gonna wanna make sure that your chicks stay uh, right there underneath the light. You want it at 95 degrees. And then as the chicks age, you want to, you can let it get a little cooler. So you're tempering your chicks to get used to room temperature. So then it goes down to 90, two or three weeks, you'd be at 85, three to four weeks, you'd be at 80, and then four to five weeks, you'd be at 75 degrees. This is a diagram I really liked. Um, it kind of showed that if it's too hot, of course, all your little chicks will be running away from that direct heat there. Um, just right if everybody's evenly distributed. Too cold if they are huddled underneath the light. And then if they're huddled to one side, maybe check and make sure there's no draft. Maybe that's where the door is or, or something like that or a window. Um, so just make sure. Now, in this photo, I would say it looks most like being too cold, um, but I do know that it was good that day. So kind of keep, you know, in this area, when they're sleeping, those babies really like to snuggle. So as long as you've checked the temperature, um, and you don't feel like they're, they're too cold, then you're good. Now, my favorite way to check the temperature is with an infrared um, thermometer, like the one right here. I picked it up, it's a cheap one. It was only like $12 or something at the tractor supply. I found this to be much more accurate and much easier to use. You can just shoot it right down in there. I would try to check the temperature right in here where the chicks are all snuggled up to see what you've got. Um, versus this one, which I used to like lay in the litter here, didn't really work that well. I pick it up, it was harder to read. Um, and then this one up here, I do not like this example. That's why I included it. So they have their thermometer stuck on the wall up here. Yes, this will give you an idea. You'll know that it's not 60 in their brooder, but you really want to know like what's that temperature right in here where they're snuggled up. So, so that's how temperature works for your chicks. Go to the next slide. All right, so do you have time for your chicks and what are some chicken chores? Um, for me, this, this is how I feel the how much time I spend on them. So I really only spend like five to 10 minutes a day for the necessities, for filling the feeders, uh, making sure they have fresh water several times throughout the day. When they're little, they will kick up all of that pine dust and it'll end up inside their, um, their water tray. And so you may have to change that several times throughout the day. It's important to handle your chicks and make sure that they get exposed to humans a lot um, if, you, if that's something that's important to you for being in the backyard. Um, check chicks for their health and then spot clean their bedding. Uh, every week usually I change the bedding out and that's, um, that's an estimate. So some weeks if, if I did a lot more spot cleaning, you know, you might be able to go a little longer or if it's a particularly messy or once they start getting bigger, you might want to change it a little bit more frequently. And then don't forget, don't just refill your washers. You want to um, wash your washers out, your, your water dishes out with like a sponge or some, some white vinegar um, at least once a week. So we talked about making sure that your chicks stay healthy. So here are some common things that you wanna make sure you are keeping an eye on with the chickens. So especially the babies can get this pasty butt. And what the pasty butt is, is really just a little bit of poop that has gotten hardened or stuck to their feathers. Um, and this photo here on the left is what a clean chicken hiney should look like. So up here is what they call the vent. And that of course is gonna be the chicken butt. So you wanna make sure that the chicken's vent is clean all the time um, because if they don't, this will get hard and they won't be able to go potty. So if this happens, all you have to do is take your chicken and wash them. 
You can use warm water and a rag, like a um, washcloth, or you can rinse them underneath um, the sink. I would use, like I said, warm water. So I wouldn't really use the hose because you wanna make sure that they don't get a chill. So I would bring the chicken into the sink and I would wash the hiney really well and pat them dry when they're done. Try not to break the skin or pull any of those tiny little feathers because usually once a chicken is got like some raw spots in the brooder box, the other chickens are attracted to it. So occasionally if another chicken's being mean or if they have a raw spot, I might set up a second brooder with just like a box with the one isolated chicken in it until they've healed and then they can go back into the mix. Um, this other thing here is called a splayed leg usually um, and it can be a deformity. This happens more if you hatch your own chicks. If you get chicks from Agway or Tractor Supply or a local farmer, usually they're not gonna put these chickens out for sale. Um, but if you order chickens online, you may get one that missed um, going through quality control and went in your box. Or if you hatch chickens on your own, then you may have this problem. Um, it can happen naturally, or it can also happen if they um, are on a non-solid surface in their brooder box. So you should never use uh, newspaper because that's too slippery of a surface for them as bedding. So if this happens, it is usually fairly fixable. All you have to do is um, bind their legs together like this for a few days and or up to a week or two and they will, um, it'll allow their, their kind of hips and their legs then to uh, re re reestablish there. All right, so next we can transition the chickens into the chicken coop. What I look for with birds that are ready to go out into the chicken coop is if they are fully feathered. So this diagram here on the right is three different breeds of chickens and their first five weeks. So you can see how much they really grow in those first five weeks. And then down here that the birds are almost entirely feathered. This one here looks like up here is a lot of the little white feathers still. So I may or may not put this bird out at five weeks old or I might wait till they're six weeks depending on what she looked like. And of course the weather outside. This year we all know it was a little snowy. When I put the birds outside, I put their heat lamp outside with them just because the nights were so cold. So our birds went outside, but their heat lamp went outside with them. Another thing I like to do is I like to keep the birds locked inside the coop and or the run for the first week or two before I let them out. And this makes sure that they know that their chicken coop is their home and that they'll come back to it every night for you. All right, some, some things to definitely avoid. Um, that heat lamp, I said we went outside. I don't think anyone wants to look outside and see their beautiful coop on fire. Um, or if your brooder is in your garage or your kitchen or your basement, you want to make sure that you can sleep well at night knowing that you're not gonna burn the house down. So heat source, very important. Here's that heat lamp I was showing you before. You can see it's got the red light underneath. The way this clamps on, I always have an extra security on them. I do not ever trust that that clamp is just gonna hold there. So I'm improvising in this photo and I have my heat lamp pinched onto my ladder. What I have that you can't see in this photo is I have a thick gauge wire that I have wrapped around this section of the ladder where you'd step and then also wrapped around part of the handle. So it is wired shut. There's no way for this to fall down and land on this cardboard. Now, this is a brooder that I tried last year and I do not think it worked. So, oops, the first part of this slide is of course the dangerous heat source. The second part of my recommendation is not to use cardboard. 
Not only is cardboard a flammable material, so it made me uncomfortable that it was that close to the heat lamp all the time, but the bottom of that box got very soggy and yicky because the chicks would splash their water and also their chicken poop, um, the bedding, it would soak right through it and the box didn't have much structural integrity after um, a couple weeks. So that did not work well. All right, your next step is then having a chicken coop. Um, just like I advise having the brooder set up before you get your chicks, I advise having your chicken coop set up before you're ready to either get your chicks or you have those six weeks, make sure you're working on it while the chicks are getting bigger. Um, a chicken coop is going to need a couple things. You want to make sure that it is a good shelter for them, that it is um, predator proof and well ventilated. In this chicken coop here, this is the one we have at the center, it's built on a trailer that was on purpose so that we could move it throughout the property. We have 211 acres. So we have it stationed behind the center there, but because we wanted it for tick control, we wanted to be able to move it to other various fields throughout the property along with, um, uh, just wanted to be able to move it around. So ours is on a trailer. It is recommended that most chicken coops you'll notice are raised off the ground like 16 to 18 inches. That so that um, there's not a water issue and also to keep predators a little bit from getting in there, um, not as easily. So you want a nice structure, well ventilated. In this one here, we used an old window. So this is a double pane window with a screen. So that's kind of nice because we can button it up pretty, pretty tight in the winter time uh, when we want to keep all the heat in or if it's a nice hot day, we can open the window uh, and let more fresh air in. For bedding inside of the coop, I like to use hay. So this is a nice clean coop here that has um, bale of hay in there. You can see the food dishes. I like to suspend them from the ceiling on chains. And this is going to cut down on waste uh, that the chickens won't kind of toss it all over the place. Uh, the water dishes are also hanging from the ceiling. Uh, you can see here we have several nest boxes, okay? The typical rule is you want one nest box per five egg laying hens. So we have um, five or six nest boxes at the center chicken coop. And you do not need a heat source in your chicken coop. Um, I went the first several years with no heat source in our coop and our chickens did just fine. Um, but I prefer to try to keep them a little warmer. So you already, I think, heard that I'm nervous about that red heat lamp. So I purchased this heater, which is specifically designed for chicken coops, and it is safe to the touch and safe for hay. So the chickens can lean right up against it, the hay can get kicked up on it, and there's no risk of fire or burning yourself or the chickens or their feet or anything. It is totally safe, and it is just a little warming plate there so that if they're chilly, they can all kind of snuggle and sleep right on it. Another thing I like in the chicken coop is this can right here. It is a garbage can and it's a metal one, so rodents and stuff can't get into it, but I keep the chicken feed in there. So this way I can easily go right out to the coop, I can fill the feeders, I can collect the eggs, and everything is right out there and easy for me to handle. Another part that's important for your chicken coop is roosting bars. So you can see here, we have an old ladder that was not stable enough for use anymore, but it worked for an amazing, really cute um, chicken rooster bars. So how big of a chicken coop do you need? That depends on how many chickens you think you need or how many you'd like to have in your yard. Um, 
chickens, turkeys, guinea, ha fowl, ducks. Um, they all, of course, are different sizes and have different needs. You can put all of these poultry breeds, all of these poultry species in the same coop. When we did our first batch of chickens and guineas at the center, I made sure I bought them within the same week. So they went into the same brooder together. So they knew each other from the very first week and they, they just got along fantastic. Um, this year I purchased a couple chickens. Um, I, we did not get any guinea fowl. We have turkey um, and we have some phantoms. Phantoms are not on this list. They're like a miniature chicken. So we have all of those. They were in the same brooder. They're now in the same coop. Everybody gets along great. If you already have a flock in your backyard and you're going to add chickens for a turkey, um, whether it's the same breed, species, or kind of poultry, when you're adding new birds in, you don't know how they'll get along together. So of course you want to do that gradually. If you can put the brooder in here for a day or a week before you let them out, this will give them a chance to meet each other with a fence in between and you might have better luck with them getting along. Most of the time there's not a problem with chickens, adding more chickens in. Uh, you wanna be careful about adding a chicken that's already an adult from somebody else's farm for bringing in diseases, mites and lice and stuff. But if you're bringing them in from, from babies that you've raised, usually there's not too much of an issue. But you do wanna make sure because there is a hierarchy and a pecking order for your, your poultry. So um, bring those extra chickens in, give them a couple days to adjust. Okay, so let's say you only wanted three birds. You knew you wanted three chickens. You would need three chickens times three square feet. You need nine square feet for your little chicken coop part. And then this part here is considered your run and you would need five to 10 square feet per bird. So like 15 to 30 square feet for your chicken run for your three, three chickens in order for them to have enough space, okay? And this is if you don't let them out or free range at all. So um, I think there's plenty, plenty of room there, especially if you let them out and then they can kind of roam around the rest of your backyard. Uh, I, I'm gonna go back to this photo here because somebody had mentioned in the beginning about wanting chickens but needing to work every day. So because this is the coop that we have at the Environmental Education Center, I purchased this chicken coop door here. It's actually an automatic metal varmint proof chicken coop door from Texas. And what it does is it has a little light sensor on it. So every morning it will open automatically and then every evening at dusk it will close automatically. Now it will close whether the birds are in there or not, but your birds usually are so just in their nature that once it starts to get dusk out, they will go right into the coop. So I never had a problem checking on them with anybody being stuck outside, um, but that door was really nice because it was automatic. And that helped because I didn't want to feel bad that the chickens were stuck in the coop on Saturday and Sunday when we weren't at work. And I also didn't want to try to get the chickens back in the coop at five o'clock when it was time to go home for the night because at five o'clock they still want to be outside foraging. So that automatic chicken coop door was great, a great purchase. Okay, so sizing your coop. Next, where do you want to place the chicken coop in your yard? This is more important than a lot of people think at first because chickens are gonna poop. And I personally thought it was cute when the chickens were on the porch until I realized how much poop was then on the porch. So my opinion of placing your chicken coop is far enough away if they're free range that they're not on the porch 
every day, all day, but not far enough away that carrying a 50 pound feed bag or 20 pound feed bag to the chicken coop for winter and making sure that the collecting eggs every day and that the chicken water is not frozen is not too far away that shoveling to get to your chicken coop is a chore before you even get there to do any of your chicken chores. So placement in the yard, look around. You want it to be in a sunny spot because chickens will lay more eggs if there's 12 hours of sunlight. Um, you want to be out of a super windy area or at least have some block from the wind to protect them. You want to make sure that it's not in like a high predator area. Uh, and of course, you want to make sure it's accessible for water, electricity, if you're going to choose to put any heat source in there. Or one of my favorite features is a heated water bucket that was well worth the 50 bucks because it means that the water stays melted and you don't have to be swapping out your water bucket uh, twice a day in the winter time. So free ranging your chickens, chicken runs or chicken fences. So you can see in this photo here, they do not probably let their chickens out very often. You can see that they have eaten every bit of grass that is in their chicken run here. Um, so this is one option, that's totally fine. You could do that, there's nothing wrong with it. You can put up a temporary chicken fence like this one here. This is very, very lightweight and easy to move around. And you could do that so that you give the grass around to their chicken coop um, time so that they don't eat it all down. Um, or you can kind of keep them out of a certain area that you don't want them in. Um, or you can let them totally free range and they can have um, literal free range of, of your entire yard. Chickens don't go too far. They usually go a couple hundred feet. The guinea fowl are very, um, very much roamers. So they can go up to a quarter mile to a mile away and they've been seen or spotted on somebody else's property or down the road, um, but then they'll come back. So, uh, well, they should come back. They're most, most likely they'll come back for you. So now we talked about the chick chores before. These are our chicken chores. I'm calling them chicken chores, but if you had a turkey in there or you had the guinea fowl in there, um, it's all gonna be the same same kind of chores. So your poultry chores, how much time do you need? What do you gotta do? So every day you're gonna wanna fill those feeders and fresh water, you're gonna collect your eggs. Sometimes if you're selling your eggs, you should collect them twice a day. Um, that's just so that they're not sitting in the hot coop all day, but um, I usually just collect mine at the end of the day when I come home from work. You're gonna wanna do 30 minutes or so um, a week we're gonna change the bedding inside the coop and you're gonna rake out their chicken yard here. So you could see all these chickens are in their chicken yard. I would just do a quick rake with, uh, with a leaf rake, scoop it up, put that in the compost pile because of course their chicken poop is excellent chick, uh, manure and fertilizer. And then twice a year, I do a nice deep clean of the chicken coop. And for that, usually I will um, dust any cobwebs, I'll um, sanitize, you know, vinegar. Sometimes I'll scrub the floor if, a, you know, a lot of the poop had kind of like gone down through some of the hay and it was kind of, um, kind of stuck on there. So do a nice coop cleaning. Usually I do one in the spring, in the fall, when I'm in the fall when I'm putting in my heat source and getting it ready for winter, changing out my feeders and my, my water bucket to that nice one that's heated so that it doesn't ice up all winter long. And then I'll take that out in the spring and I'll do you know another nice cleaning in the springtime as well. So. All right, so what are you gonna feed them? There are tons of options in the store. You can get 
um, really basic feed, you can get scratch feed, you can get organic, you can get non-GMO, um, but whatever choice you get or whatever brand you get, you're going to want to start with a chick starter when they're in the brooder. Usually you feed them the chick starter until they're about um, 13, 14, 16 weeks old or so. Once they get to maturity, that's when they're going to start to lay eggs is that 13 to 20 week mark. And you're going to want to switch them to an egg layer that's going to contain calcium. So that's really important for them to develop healthy eggs is that they have a calcium source. So you can either switch them to the egg layer, which will say right on the bag contains calcium with whatever percent, um, or uh, you can also offer them oyster shells and that way they'll get their calcium that way. You should always have grit available for, for them. I mix when I have chicks in the brooder, I always mix like a handful of grit into my feed when I'm putting it in for the day. So they get their grit, it's built right into, I add it right into their feed. So I don't have to worry about them having any di digestion issues. You can definitely give your, your poultry, your chicken, your kitchen scraps. Um, I highly recommend it. Keep all of that organic waste out of the landfill. Feed it to your chickens. Um, you can give them chicken treats. I know some people like to freeze corn and all kinds of other stuff into um, sunflower seeds and ice cubes and feed it to them in the hot days. They like that kind of stuff. And then um, uh, it should be species specific diet. So depending on what species you have, uh, just double check with what they are. Like the guinea fowl, when they're babies, I fed them a game bird mix which is closer to what like a turkey would be or like if you had pheasants and stuff. So um, just has a higher protein because they're not as domesticated. So, uh, so that's what they, they need. Now I did mix that together when I had them all in the same brooder. So I would kind of, sometimes I'm sure the chickens were eating the higher protein one, but you know, and back and forth, but I had it available to them and um, I'm sure some people might keep them separate, but for me, it was more important that those birds got to know each other than to keep them separate for their food. So your chicken, chicken digestive system, um, this goes for most of your poultry. It's a little bit different than ours, of course, or, or um, our other pets, like our dogs or cats or goats or whatever else you've got. So the, the chicken digestive system is going to start with all of the food going in through the beak. They have no teeth. It goes down into the crop and that's where they're going to hold all of their food storage. And you'll notice them when, they're, when your chickens are running around during the day, they'll, you'll kind of see like a lump in their throat where like their feathers and you're like, oh, you don't need to be eating anymore. Um, you've got plenty stored in there. Um, and it can remain in that chicken crop for like 12 hours. From there, it's going to go down into the gizzard. And the gizzard is this really hard organ that's very muscular. And that's where it's going to get ground up with those pieces of grit. That's why it's really important that we have the grit in their feed is because um, the, it gets ground up here in the gizzard. And then from there, it'll go through their digestive tract and then out their vent. So some life stages of the chicken and some backyard chicken milestones. We consider them baby chicks or chicks from the ages of one to four weeks. From five weeks to 16 weeks, we call them a teenager stage. And I think that this is important to point out because sometimes if you have a rooster in that teenager stage to that next stage there before they are mature at the age of maybe 20 to 25 weeks, your roosters can be extra feisty and um, they might not necessarily be an aggressive rooster for their entire lives. It's just that they're in that adolescent stage 
where they may need some time before their true personality comes out. So a rooster is good to have for your, <clears throat> for your flock because he will alert them when there's predators around. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you do not need a rooster if you, you do not need a rooster to just have eggs. You do need a rooster if you want fertilized eggs. So if you want to keep a rooster around and he's being a little bit feisty and he's within that five week to 20 weeks of age, you may want to give him a little bit of time to see if he matures before you decide to get rid of him. So that's why that slides on here. This next one about how an egg is made, I thought was pretty interesting. So it only takes a half hour for the yolk to release. It takes three hours for the whites to form around the yolk one hour for the shell membrane um, to be made into the shape and protect the yolk and the, um, the white membrane or the white. And then it takes about 20 hours for the shell to form. And then of course the egg will emerge. And that bloom is this healthy bacteria that comes on the egg while it's fresh out of the coop. So when she lays her egg, it's covered in this bloom. That'll help kind of protect it and keep it safe. I think I see some, some um, chat questions coming in here. Let's see what they are. Okay, so one was, do you need a rooster? We kind of just talked about that. You do not need a rooster, although it's recommended. You will get eggs every day, even if you have no rooster. If you have a rooster, they might be fertilized. They might not still be, but they might be fertilized and you'd be able to incubate them or let one of your hens go broody, they call it, and let her have her own babies. So a pullet, somebody said, I've heard it's better to buy pullets rather than chicks. So a pullet is going to be a sexed female. And if you know that you do not want a rooster and you know you want eggs, it might be better to spend the 50 cents or a dollar extra per chick to buy the pullet. Somebody said, how old should they be to go outside? Ours are almost four weeks. It is really nice out. Um, and of course today it's like 80 here. So at four weeks, I would, I would let them go outside right now in the coop. I would just make sure that I didn't let them free range for a little bit. Typically you want them to be six weeks of age or fully feathered. Um, so as long as you make sure that they're not drafty and I maybe stick the light out there if it gets cold one night. If you notice that it's going to drop way down to 40 one night, maybe stick the heat lamp in there. But otherwise, you'll probably be fine with that at four weeks old. And then somebody said, if dual chicks are able to be butchered at six weeks, does that mean you'll spend more on their entire life in the brooder? So dual meat, dual chickens, you wouldn't butcher until like 16 weeks because they're going to be a bird that would be four eggs or four meat. So that would be about 16 weeks. They would not spend more time in the brooder. They would spend the same amount of time in the brooder and they would just have more time in the coop of free ranging. And I think I have a slide about this a little later. Um, they'll have a much tougher meat than um, than the meat chicken or the heritage red chicken. And somebody said, do you need to add the grit on top of the chicken starter? Yes, that's what I do. Right from the beginning, I throw a little bit in there um, so it's mixed in and they're getting little pieces of that grit right away with all of their feed. Um, the grit is actually grit 
and you do not have to buy the grit from the store. I usually do because I'm already in there and I'm grabbing feed and you don't go through a ton of it anyway. So I'll usually buy like a small bag of grit for $10. Um, but you could use the grit that's like on the side of your driveway. Just make sure it's the same size as what's in the bag at the store. You want it to be very fine. And another question, do you take away the food at the night for the dual purpose birds when they are old enough? Um, you do take the food away from them, not so much at night. I usually only feed the birds once a day. So if they eat all of their food, all my birds are free range in addition to being fed. So I feel like I feed them enough that I know they're not hungry, but I do want to leave them so that they're not full because I want them out there foraging and doing some of those. Um, one, it's their natural instinct, but two, I really do want them um, eating some insects and stuff like that throughout the yard. So I only feed all my chickens once a day. And then if it's a bird that you're going to butcher the next day, you pull their food and they get no food for 12 hours. And you do that because you don't want their crops and their um, gizzards and stuff full. So, all right. So those we're caught up on our questions. Let's go to our next slide here. All right, so something to be aware of is chickens molt. Um, if you're new to chickens, or I think we are all familiar with chickens molting, but sometimes it catches you off guard and you're not ready for it. Um, the first time a chicken will molt is usually in the fall and they're usually around 12 or 18 months old. So sometimes a bird is not 12 or 18 months old in the fall, so you might get molting in the spring. But um, once they're over a year old, usually it'll be a fall thing that you'll see molting. And that's because their hormones change when the light, when the days get shorter. So um, you could have a really severe molt here, or you can have a bird where he's just losing some of the feathers. But molting is losing their feathers. It's perfectly natural. It's fine. And those new feathers will grow right in. Um, if I saw this bird in my coop, I might check him to make sure that he wasn't having any skin issues besides molting, um, but a molt can cause severe baldness like that. Although usually it's, it's more, more modest like this guy here who looks like he was just in a fight. He's all ruffled up and losing some feathers. So collecting eggs. I got this information right here from the Penn State Extension um, for how to properly handle eggs if you want to consume them. Uh, not just consume them, but sell them. So they recommend that you should collect your eggs twice a day. I already told you I only do mine once a day, but I only use them for personal use. If I were to sell them, I probably would collect them twice a day. You're gonna wash them with warm water right away. I know some people you can buy like a special egg wash in the store. Some people use vinegar. You should not let them soak in the water and you should not let them soak in vinegar. Whatever you do, you wanna just wash them warm water or the vinegar, quickly rinse it off and that's all you need. When you store them, you're gonna to want to, of course, use your oldest eggs before you use your newer eggs. That's just good rotation of, of stock so that they don't go spoiled. Um, if you find that you have like a dozen eggs that are getting close to their date, it's a good way to hard boil them. And then of course, you'll get a little bit more life out of them. And farm fresh eggs are harder to peel than your store eggs when you hard boil them and that's because they are so fresh. So if you like hard boiled eggs, it's my family eats a lot of hard boiled eggs. So our, that's what we do is we leave some of those eggs on purpose so that we can hard boil them like on week three and they peel much better. Um, so you could do that. So you want to try to use your eggs before the three week time period is up. Although I've talked to some people that say they've been fine after six weeks. I don't particularly watch the date as much as I do the smell test. So if it's my own kitchen 
and I'm not sure I would crack it over a separate bowl. If there's any question, I toss it out. But if it smells and looks fine, I'm gonna eat it or put it in my cookies or whatever we're doing with it. You wanna store your eggs um, at that 40 to 50 range. The refrigerator is a fine place for that. And it is perfectly legal for anyone with less than 3,000 laying hens to sell their eggs in the state of Pennsylvania. The only laws you have to abide by are these four right here. You must sell them within five days of laying. You must keep them refrigerated. You must not use egg cartons from someone else's business. And you must label them with your name or farm name, your address or where the chicken coop's located, the date of packaging, um, statement of identity, which is just eggs, um, contents, and then keep refrigerated and then unclassified. You can classify eggs by shape and size and a couple other things. So that's a whole nother conversation we're not gonna get into today. So you'll just put unclassified on there because um, in, unless that's something that you wanted to get into and then you could classify them. So that's collecting eggs. Um, I put these on here because I was going to email this presentation to anybody, everybody, just so that they had it. So if there was anything that we were talking about today that you had questions about, we talked about like a broody hen, that means that it's a hen that a female that is ready to sit on a clutch of eggs um, then clutch is a group of eggs that she is ready to nest on. Um, we have a cockerel, which is a male rooster who's less than one year old. We have a cock that is a male chicken, a rooster who's over a year old. We have a comb that is the red part. Usually it's red or fleshy colored on top of the chicken's head. The crop is that part in their neck that we talked about in the digestive system where the food is stored. A dust bath. I'm glad because I forgot to mention that before. I always have a dust bath available to my chickens in their chicken run. And usually I sprinkle a little bit of food grade diatomaceous earth in that area. You'll notice your chickens make their own dust bath area. You'll notice that they like kind of scratch at an area and it kind of gets like bowl shaped. So that's where they are naturally liking to do their dust bath. It's a natural instinct for them. Um, it's part of how they clean themselves. So if you sprinkle a little bit of diatomaceous earth inside that dust bath area, that will keep it from, keep your birds from getting like lice and mites because that diatomaceous earth is somehow sharp for the mites and the lice, but not sharp for your chickens. So it'll keep the lice and mites off. Free range, we uh, talked about that. So that is when you literally open the coop and your chickens have free range of your entire yard. The gizzard is the organ within inside the chicken that grinds their food. It's um, part of the stomach. We have grit, which is the small rocks and pebbles that helps them grind their food up and that's found inside the gizzard. We have grower feed, which is given to young chickens, um, 10 weeks of age before they start laying. So you could do like chick grower, layer, or just go right from chick to layer. Some people like to use the grower when they're doing meat chickens. Um, we have a hen, which is an adult female that's over one year old, means that she should be able to lay eggs. We have the incubation, which is um, the process of hatching fertilized eggs um, through turning and heating. You can let the egg laying hen go broody and she would incubate them herself, or we can buy an incubator and we can uh, do it inside the house or in the barn. Um, that's another way to get chickens. I think I forgot that on the where to get your chicken slide. You could always buy fertilized eggs um, from a farmer if you wanted to do that. I know that the, the North Pocono School District does that with their second graders. They incubate a bunch of eggs every year and have some chickens. Um, layers, they are chickens that are raised for egg production. Layer feed is given to, to hens who are of laying age and that contains calcium. 
Molt is when the chickens lose their old feathers so new ones can grow in. Um, Marquise disease, which is a virus that is preventable with a vaccine. You have to give the vaccine right after birth. Usually that's when you buy your chickens and it says vaccinated or non-vaccinated. Um, we don't have this problem in Northeast PA, so we can choose to buy our chickens vaccinated or non-vaccinated. If we lived in California, we would only be able to buy them if they were pre-vaccinated. So that is um, your choice. Nest boxes is where we're gonna encourage our hens to lay, although they may not choose to lay in the nest box. Pecking orders, the social structure of the chickens and where their place is within the flock. A pullet is a young hen that is less than one year old. A roost is somewhere where they can perch. Um, they like to roost when they sleep, especially. Their run is their enclosure that's attached to the chicken coop so they can run around. While my birds free range, I do have a run for them. So if it's rainy or snowy, my run is covered. So they, they have the option to be inside the coop, totally sheltered, or in the run with um, fencing on either side and a cover, or then they can come out into the yard. Scratch is a kind of feed that you can give to them that is more whole pieces. It's not as pellet or crumble that you would get in the, the store, which you can get scratch in the store too, but it's more um, whole corn or cracked corn, cracked oats, wheats, millets, and other grains. And it's supposed to encourage them to forage like their natural behavior. A spur is going to be a sharp little claw or fingernail on the back usually of the rooster. Starter feed is what you're gonna give them before they're 10 weeks old. Starter feed is what you start them on. Straight run is when you purchase your birds and they are not sexed from the hatchery or from the store, so that'll be your cheapest option. The vent is their behind and their waddles are the areas um, underneath their beak and different breeds will have different, different kinds. Of course, the turkey has a more extravagant waddle, um, but the guinea fowl also do as well. All right, so I'm gonna give you my funny warning here. Chickens are the gateway animal to farming and chicken math is real. You can ask my husband about that joke photo in the center because that is my opinion, chicken space, Look at all this space. I can fit at least five or six more chickens in there, if not more. Um, and then this one I thought over here was funny too. This is one chicken, this is three chickens, this is eight chickens, and this is about 10 chickens. Do we have any questions? I will unmute the mic, although I think that chat feature worked pretty well. Um, and I also want to mention that this program was provided free because we received a grant from the Overlook Estate Foundation this year to increase our chickens at the center and our guinea fowl and provide some chicken education. So let me see, I will unshare my, I think I have one more photo for you. So just for more fun, uh, chicken math, it's more confusing than Common Core. And um, if I was supposed to have 10 chickens, then 40 it is. All right, so I will unshare my screen and we will do some question and answer. Hi. You can unmute if you have questions and then we'll go to this chat here too. Oh, Chris and Tim, thanks guys. I'm glad you liked it. What All right, so we're ready for questions. Go ahead. What would you recommend for someone who wants to go to uh, the butcher early but still wants to get eggs? What kind of chicken? I thought, I thought you said the duels were ready to be butchered in six weeks, but I guess you said 16. The duel is gonna be 16. There's yeah. something called the um, Red Ranger, and he's that. ready for butcher around 
12 weeks and he will have eggs and you could butcher them. He'll Those meat eggs. chickens will not ever lay eggs and you will have to butcher them. They continue to grow and um, you'll want to put them out of their misery after a few weeks. <laughs> Um, would Tractor Supply carry those, what were they, Red what? Red Ranger. Will Tractor Supply carry them? They definitely have them online. I don't okay. think I've ever seen them on like their chick days. Okay, thank you. Yep. Can you still eat fertilized eggs if you collect them immediately after they've been laid? trying to determine if I need a rooster or not. You absolutely can still eat the fertilized eggs. Um, if you know you have a rooster and you think he's doing his job, it's important that you collect your eggs every day and then you won't ever have to worry about having any surprises when you crack your eggs for breakfast in the morning. Um, the fertilized egg, you probably won't even be able to tell that it's been fertilized if you collected it that same day it was laid. Can you recommend a source pros and cons for different kinds of chicken, turkey, and guineas? Um, I've purchased and had success with um, Hoover online, Hoover hatcheries online. And um, I just got like the cheapest guinea fowl. I think they were like the pearl headed, pearl colored. Um, the chickens, we've done Americana, we've done Rhode Island Red, we've done the Bard Rock. Really, almost all of those chickens have been great. And this is my first year with the, um, the white turkey. We bought two of them. And I originally thought that we were purchasing them so we could have Christmas and Thanksgiving dinner. But I think that I have a, um, a pair that will be mating. It turns out that one of them is trying to, um, one's a boy for sure. And I'm pretty sure the other one's a girl. So I think that I'm going to let them, um, let them go this year and see if we can get any turkey fertilized eggs and see how that goes. So my recommend, my recommendation, if you want to purchase the guineas, you'll probably have to order them online. And if you're already ordering online, I would probably just pick my turkeys and my chickens, whatever I was going to do. And, and, um, order them online. Do I have electricity running to my coop? And preparing yours, we don't have electricity. I do have electricity both in my home coop and the coop at the Environmental Education Center. It is not like a fence, fancy trench or anything. I just put the extension cord, a nice exterior extension cord, and I run it in through the window of the chicken coop. So that's how I get electricity out there. Both of my coops are within 100 feet of the house or the building for an outlet, so um, not too far away. Anybody else? What's a good number of chickens to start with? Oh, that's the chicken math question there. Um, I would recommend definitely start with three. Even if you're scared and you don't want to get too many, don't just get one. Um, get three because they are a flock animal and they need that companionship. So um, I, would def I would say three. If you're comfortable and have the room, you know, maybe get five or ten or seven is a nice number or six, you'd get you know, a dozen eggs every, every two days. That's plenty for most families and you'd have some for your friends as well. Does a rooster live in the same coop as the hens? Yep, he'll go right in there just like he's a regular chicken, right? Just like he's a hen, he'll go right in there. Did I see somebody kind of raising their hand on the video? You can unmute yourself if you know how to do that or raise your hand and I will try to unmute you for you. Okay. Thank you, good presentation. I'm glad you liked it. I hope this worked out 
it's so hard to do these presentations virtually like this. It's, it's a different dynamic than if you're in the same building and sharing a room and can talk um, amongst ourselves throughout the presentation, but I'm glad it was informative. Anybody else? All right, well, if that's, um, if that's all the questions, I am going to, I think we'll have a link to this live video um, presentation so that we can watch it and they'll post it on like the Environmental Center's YouTube page. So we'll be sharing the link for that. I will also save this presentation as a PDF and I have a couple other resources for brooder and temperature that I will email everybody. And if you guys don't mind, I would like to send along with that a survey for other programs you might be interested in. So one of the things we're going to do more of moving forward is not only this chicken presentation, but some other gardening and homesteading stuff. So if you're interested in, I don't know, let me know so we can design programs around it. Gardening, seed starting, permaculture, cheese making, let me know. So if you have the time and you want some more of those programs, take a minute for that short survey I'll send around. If not, um, thank you guys for attending and we hope to get back to our traditional programs before too long. All right, thanks guys. <laughs>